Have you struggled to find a really, really great assistant? Well, if you have, I have a brilliant and phenomenal resource for you, my friend Timothy Francis, because he knows so much about how to find, how to get, and how to keep a great assistant. Enjoy. Hi, Shannon Waller here, and welcome to Team Success. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to be interviewing a very good friend of mine and someone with whom I have a mutual passion, and that is having really, really, really great support teams, and in particular, great assistants. So I would love to introduce you to my good friend, Timothy Francis, who is an expert, in fact, has an entire business around hiring great assistants for really talented, capable business owners who really want to grow and to scale. So Timothy, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been looking forward to this. I loved meeting you at Bullseye Conference not that long ago, but since then we spent a fair bit of time together, (laughs) strategized a book, which was really fun. And I just have really enjoyed and appreciate our conversations around great assistments. So welcome. Pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm a huge fan of Strategic Coach. Love it. All right. So let's jump in. And again, There's lots of different things I could do by way of an introduction, Timothy, but you've been really passionate about getting great assistance for a long time now, and knowing that you have had a virtual business for quite some time. So this new world that we're in right now when we're recording this, which is in May of 2020, where you thought you had a virtual assistant before, now you for sure you do, (laughs) or you need one. (laughs) One of the two. Everyone's gone remote. This is kind of your normal. So can you talk a little bit about how you got started? How did you end up at the place with this really successful business of yours called Great Assistant? You bet. In fact, I'm astounded. It's been 12 years. I'm astounded. We've now helped hire 300 assistants. Like, it's just kind of like, where did the time go? And, you know, maybe I'm just getting a little bit older. I don't know. But I, <laughs> but yeah, it was over a decade ago. And I was really, really passionate about success and business. And I, you know, I really wanted to make my, my mark in the world. And I had a, a series of unfortunate events that kind of happened back to back to back. I tried hiring overseas for $4 an hour in some of the typical places like India and the Philippines. I tried Jamaica. I tried all over the world. And I kept running into some of the same issues over and over and over again. Sometimes there's issues related to time zones. Sometimes I didn't understand the culture, and so I fell short. Sometimes it was a language barrier issue. I also discovered, lo and behold, that at least 50% of all the problems were because I was a bad leader. Who knew? Who knew, right? right? So I didn't realize it at the time, and I thought, oh, you know, this assistant thing just doesn't work. So Mm. I basically gave up on the process and said what all self-respecting entrepreneurs do. They said, well, if it's to be, it's up to me. You know, <laughs> so, so off I went. And at the time, I actually had a marketing agency, an online marketing agency, which lent itself to virtual work. And kind of right before that time, this series of unfortunate events were happening about an 18-month period where I got rid of my assistants. The real estate market had crashed. I'd lost $100,000 of other people's money. I myself, my own personal residence went upside down by $100,000. So I was down 200 k Someone I looked up to, a mentor of mine, ended up being one of the two leaders of what turned into a Ponzi scheme, and his business partner was convicted in court, barred from holding securities for 25 years, a $225,000 fine. Like It was just like, oh my God. So all this stress and exhaustion of me doing everything myself right in my business matched with such exhaustion and the stress of all this loss. And I developed an illness mm. called erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum is a swelling. It starts in your ankles, moves up your legs. And for me, it even went into my elbows. And the swelling is so bad and it's so painful, you actually can't even really stand or walk. So I had to move in for full-time care with my parents. Thank God I've got just amazing parents. This is in Edmonton, Canada, actually St. Albert in the suburbs. I was humbled by the support of my parents. And I was also humbled by just how vulnerable I was, how weak and vulnerable I was. So I went through every emotion from January through March of 2011. I went through every emotion from despair and anger and resentment, humiliation, everything. I think I was 28 at the time, 28 and have the mobility of a 90 year old or worse. I always remember a couple of really key moments. One of the key moments that really sunk in the gravity of the situation was when my mom asked me if would I prefer to get a flipped over laundry hamper in the shower so I could sit and bathe myself or if I wanted a sponge bath in bed. And I went, wow, this is where I am. 
And on top of that, I'm down 200 grand and I've got no way to pay it back. So I get that that's a pretty dramatic story and not everybody's had that level of health crisis, you know, but we all have different crises in our life, whether it's a relationship breakdown, a health breakdown, or a money breakdown, or maybe some combination. And I think what it really allowed me to do, because I'm a pretty stubborn, driven, focused person. I think it took probably divine intervention to stop me in my tracks to just say, hey, man, like, take a look at what you're really doing here. And I had this really profound moment. It was in, I think it's probably February of 2011, as I'm in month two of my illness. I felt this warmth in my body and I felt a tingling like I'd never felt before. And then I heard a voice and it said, Tim, this whole entrepreneurship thing, is this what you want? And like, I don't know if a second went by or a minute or an hour, like time stood still. And like, had I not been there, I would have kind of called BS on the story. You know what I mean? It's just, it seems like it's out of a movie, but I was there. And I heard another voice. It was a quiet voice. It was a weak voice, but it was a very clear voice. And it just said, yes, this is what I want. And in that moment, all these dominoes started to fall. And by dominoes, I mean like realizations of one thing to the next. And I realized that I needed to be focused on mastery. I'd been so focused on fame and fortune, and now I need to be focused on mastery. I saw two quotes. One quote said, hell is meeting the man I could have been. Mm -hmm. Hell is meeting the man I could have been. And I mean, that sticks with me to this day. Like, am I really making good on all the gifts I've been given? And I've been given a lot of great gifts, you know, to be born into a great part of the world and all the advantages that are here. The second quote I saw is that life is a team sport and business is a team sport. Mm-hmm. One of my mentors who'd sold this company for over $114 million, he said, Tim, one of the secrets of my success was realizing that everything that I ever achieved or received in my lifetime came through other people. Your other clients are other people. Your teammates are other people. Your vendors are other people. Your investors are other people. Your mentors are other people. So I felt like I had this new fork in the road where I needed to decide, am I going to continue being the John Wayne of the situation here and be the hero and, you know, really wear that badge of honor of I do it all myself. I'm the rugged individualist because that's what I know I can count on is me. But if I go down that road, I'm risking not fulfilling my full potential and the full impact I could make in the world and the full good that I could deliver. And how would I feel about that when I meet my maker, right? So the alternative was to face my former demons of all these failed hires, all this bad management that I'd kind of put into the world, all this inadequate delegation, all this like, just this whole area I didn't want to have to deal with. I was avoidant. I was avoidant of it for a very long time. But when you realize the cost of not tackling that, not learning how to be a good coach, how to be a good leader, the cost is literally like your life mission, like the life contribution. All of a sudden you realize the opportunity cost of not picking up those skills and learning how to be a great leader and a great team player, or even just a good, you don't have to be great, just like an acceptably good (laughs) leader, an acceptably good coach to your team. In fact, I think it's Dan. Didn't Dan say, imagine how big your business could be if you just mastered the skill of delegation? I think that's a Dan Sullivan quote somewhere. I thought I saw somewhere. Sounds like him. So, I mean, you know, Shannon, I didn't know what to delegate first. I didn't know how to let go of control. That was like, I'm a control freak. I'm sure I'm the only entrepreneur who's ever said that, right? <laughs> sure. And thirdly was, P.S., I'm 200K in the hole. And like just getting back onto my feet with this like internet marketing company, So, I mean, talk about being in like a bad kind of triangle of circumstances of being terrified to let go, terrified it's going to be a total wreck. I can't afford to lose a single dime at this point. And then not even knowing where to start, it was not a very comfortable set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And yet I went for it. Instead of continuing with attempting overseas for a few dollars an hour, I said, okay, It's time to get serious about a long-term teammate that is going to be by my side, not for weeks and months, but, you know, probably years. And I asked myself a question that has since become a kind of a bit of a famous question. I call it the three-year test. And that is, what would have to be true about everything in my hiring and training and onboarding process and management, ongoing management? What would have to be true if the next assistant that I hire is going to be with me for three years? 
And in the past, I asked the two-year question that seemed too short, four years seemed too far in the future, something about three years. And as I've shared with other entrepreneurs, they've kind of resonated with that as well. And all of a sudden, I went from hating the idea of having to interview multiple people to being like excited about it because it's like, wow, this is my person for the next three years. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. And then I went from dreading the idea of having to onboard someone to being excited doing it because if I do this really well, I can get it done in a few weeks and I'm never going to have to answer another question about like, what's my username and password, you know? And I went to loving the idea of wanting to train someone because the faster I could train them, the faster that I would get things off my plate, the faster that I could move to the next level. My assistant could also go to the next level and they could take more and more off my plate. So everything shifted when I just asked myself that question. And the other big insight I got was that, you know, an assistant, yes, on an income statement, they are an expense. Like there's just mathematically, factually, they're an expense. What I realized though, was that if I asked a different question, if I said, what is the value of my relationship with my assistant? Instantly, I went, well, oh my goodness, the relationship is a profit center. Mm -hmm. Because every time I pay my assistant $20 an hour or whatever it is that they're being paid, that frees me up to go and make 40, 50, 100, 1,000, well, whatever that number is, dollars per hour. And even if it's only a $10 spread, I pay them 20 and I make 30 or something like that, it's still a spread. And that's like literally the definition of leverage. So I went full force in. I fumbled and bumbled my way around as best I could. And I ended up finding Sarah. Recently, probably a year or two ago, I went back and went, geez, what was the financial impact of that decision? And in the 12 months prior to hiring my first great assistant, you know, based in the United States or Canada, natively understands American business culture, you know, natively understands my language, my first language, which is English, and is coming out of corporate or professional America. That's kind of how I define a great assistant. You know, it's someone who meets that profile. And I actually asked her the three-year question. I said, if this goes well, could you see yourself having this role for three years? And that was also a great litmus test. And so she said, yeah, absolutely. You know, she had young kids that were getting up. She had just left working in a busy law firm. She was a paralegal. And so she was excited to be at home with her young family. So she took a pay cut because the value of being able to work from home was priceless, Mm -hmm. which we can talk about the hiring triad maybe later in our conversation today. It's a huge insight. So I looked at how much money I made in the 12 months prior to having my great assistant, and I made $39,000. Thirty nine thousand dollars was the total money I made in the twelve months leading up to the day that I hired my assistant, my first ever great assistant, Sarah. In the twelve months after hiring my great assistant, Sarah, I was still selling the same product to the same market. Everything was the same. The main difference is I had a great assistant, and I made a hundred and seven thousand dollars. Wow, that is quite the change. I nearly tripled my income, nearly. <laughs> And everyone says like, oh, well, I don't make enough money. I'm not rich. Like, I don't get to have a fancy assistant. Uh, I think that's an antiquated view. I really think that's an antiquated view. Well, the whole idea of your assistant being a profit center, first of all, I love every second of that. And it's so great because all of your thinking is so aligned with coach in terms of treat your team members as investments, not costs, right? Mm-hmm. So exactly, put them on a totally different side. They may technically be an expense, but you never ever want to treat a human as an expense. Smart business people try and minimize expenses. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be minimized. I don't think anyone else does mm-hmm. either. No, you want to be actually invested in and, and to grow. And the three-year framework, which is, you know, very similar to our, our factor question, only you've really customized it for, you know, what has to be true. So you're like back-ending it, which I love. Like you're reverse engineering mm-hmm. the whole process. Very strategic question. I love that one. But this is so great. So Timothy, one of the reasons why I was so excited about this conversation is because a lot of people that I meet, and I, by the way, mostly work with our highest level clients, the ones you know doing really, really well, despite current circumstances or maybe because of them, but still sometimes hiring the person to support them is still one of the last hires they make. They'll hire mm. a president of their company. They'll hire- A chief. salesperson. Exactly. 
yeah. director yeah. of sales before they'll actually, it's like, well, I kind of share someone with another, you know, executive or what have you. And so it's interesting that investment in yourself. I mean, our Colby's are different <laughs> opposites almost, but very complimentary, but you measure everything. Like you're someone who is super efficiency minded. You don't want to be doing the same thing twice. You know, if someone else is trained, good, they've got this. So I think you kind of have a way of letting go, which is really powerful. But you also measure everything. So you know, you know exactly what's working and what's not. So one of the things I really appreciate about your process, and we'll, we'll share little tidbits from it because it's way more, more than we could cover in one podcast, but you have really discerned some processes, some strategies, some wisdom about how to hire and keep a great assistant, and then also who you need to be as a manager, leader, whatever you want to call them, on the other side so that no one fires you <laughs> as the boss, because <laughs> people do that. And another thing for me is you really chose to focus on the relationship, not just having it be a transaction. So mm -hmm. there's so much that you've covered already. I love it. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give for someone? I mean, you've just given the really solid financial structure to have them be a profit center, like you were actually able to measure that. You have a bit of a litmus test, I think, about whether or not someone's actually ready to hire someone. What kind of questions do you ask people to discern whether or not they're ready? Yeah, I think there's three questions because, you know, there's such thing as getting an assistant too early. Something we always talk about in our discovery calls with, you know, people who are interested in our service is is it too early? So fit timing and profitability are the three factors that we look for. So for example, you know, if someone wants an assistant to come in and do sales calls for them, I mean, that's not in an executive assistant role. If someone's looking for someone who is only a few hours a week, like two to three hours a week, again, it's not a fit for us. And the reason for which is in my own experience from working with so many different assistants, especially earlier in my career, if you don't have enough volume, you just never develop a momentum. Mm. Like if your assistant has to ask, what's my login again? Or which client am I working with here today? You're losing the very reason that you're there in the first place, which is efficiency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you're ready to bring someone on, let's say upwards of 10 hours a week, you know, or something very close to that is probably the basement in terms of how much time is needed to have that sense of continuity and momentum. Uh -huh. So there's the fit question, timing. So part of that is like, you need to understand that anytime you bring on a new team member, because you're looking to get leverage, you're looking to get speed, ease, flow, you're looking to focus on what I call surgeon in the room. You want to be the surgeon in the room, not the nurse or the janitor or the coordinator. You know, definitely a unique ability conversation there. Uh -huh. There's really, really, really something there around, unfortunately, you know, the dream is free, but the journey isn't. <laughs> You're actually... I like that line. <laughs> I think John Maxwell said that. I like to give credit where credit is due. Uh -huh. You're actually worse off. You're literally worse off when you get a team member of any kind. doesn't matter if it's an assistant, a salesperson, or a VP of marketing. And you're worse off because... You got to onboard that person. You got to train that person. They need to get familiar with your clients, your products, your services, the teammates, even the outside consultants or subcontractors or providers that they're working with, right? And it's only natural. Like if you were moving to a new neighborhood, it would take you time to get to know where's the mailbox and who are the neighbors. You know what I mean? Like, how does this house work? You know, where's the thermostat? Like, and that's what it's like. Someone is moving into your business and they're, they got to get acquainted. So, you know, I don't think there's ever such thing as it's too late to get an assistant. I'll just say that if you wait too long, which is the other end of the spectrum, it just gets really, really hard. When you are buried with 80 hours of work, you have no slack in the line to spend 10, 15 hours a week to get someone up to speed in those first few weeks, which can seem absolutely backwards because you're getting an assistant to save you time, not to put more work on your plate. I think there's a graduation in a few different ways. One is graduating from the view of assistant as expense to relationship as profit center. I think that's a graduation point. I think there's also a graduation point from lottery thinking. If I just meet the right person, I'll be happy for the rest of my life. If I just have a million dollars in the bank, I'll be set. I'll never have to worry about money again. That's the lottery view of life. Most people have come to realize that they have a little wear on the tires of life, if you will, that doesn't exist. And so the idea of dropping down some money and I'm going to get an assistant and just bingo, like everything's going to change. That's not how it goes. There's actually 
a period of time from when you hire them until what, you know, what is really a break even point that you're putting more time and energy and maybe even money into them than you're getting back from them. Now I have good news. If you're hiring with the view that this person's going to be with me for the next three years and you're expecting to have a long-term teammate, then you will hit that break even point. I've got no doubt about that. You're going to hit that break even point where, yeah, you spent an hour or two training them on a day, but you also woke up that morning and they'd already taken care of an hour to two hours. And it's just like magically in your inbox or something like that, you know, and you're like, how did that black magic happen? Right. And if you stick with the process even further, you're not only going to cross a break even point, you're going to hit that original maybe even lottery level of expectation where it's like, oh, I'm just going to wake up and I'm not going to have to answer the email at all anymore or something like that. Like you will hit that point, which is really exciting. And what's really cool is if you've got a long-term mindset, the compound interest just really kicks in. Like, you know, Albert Einstein said, you know, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world, right? And it's true with an assistant. So like, I can't tell you how many times I've just been dazzled. Like I'm in the territory now where I'm reading and responding to fewer than 10 emails a week. Yeah. And I've a got, week. I thought you were going to say a day. No, fewer than 10 emails a week. And I've got eight teammates and we have hundreds of clients. Like, you know, we got a something substantial going here. Right. And like, I've got some extremely, you know, high value clients. Like when I get hired to do private consulting one-on-one, it's at a thousand dollars an hour. And so there's very sensitive documents that, you know, fly around and all the rest. And, and yet I'm still only 10 emails a week. I can't tell you how many times I've also arrived at a location on a plane booked by my assistant at a, say, an Airbnb, if it's a condo or something like that, booked by my assistant, and it's the right flight, and it's the right condo, and then the best of all, this is just the cherry on top. I get there, Shannon, I open up the fridge, and the groceries I want for the week are already sitting in the fridge. How bad a s s is that? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I- the president... <laughs> you told me about that. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. <laughs> you know, Well, when I first met you, you were flying around doing a fair bit. Now, obviously, you're doing it differently. But yeah, you just had it all set up. Your life was completely arranged. Mm-hmm. Now, the other advantage, and in case we haven't made this clear yet, you're somebody who hires great virtual assistants for other people. I'm not sure if we actually spelled that out or not, right. but we probably should. But you're also really clear on what you want and what can be done. And mm. I think it's interesting. I think some other folks that I've met, and even myself to some extent, I'm sort of like, well, what can you do? And I feed them that rather than going, this is what I want done. So now I know that you work with people for how they can be a better entrepreneur, that how they can be a better business owner, how they can be a better leader, a better manager. Part of your process, I mean, you have a great process for, you know, knowing whether or not someone's a right fit, but then also you have a way of helping people kind of work up to that level of compound interest with new assistants. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you have some great strategies for making sure people don't bite off way more than they can chew too early and get them started right. so you can get some momentum. Yeah, because I realized you know, somewhere along the way that at least 50% of all the problems were because I was being a poor delegator, leader, manager. I realized like, if I'm going to have this business that helps people to get an assistant, we should probably also include some training for the entrepreneur so they can keep the assistant second half of the equation. Right. And in fact, I think there's actually four levels. One is saying, I'm going to get an assistant. The second is saying, I'm going to get an assistant and I'm going to keep the assistant. Mm -hmm. The third is I'm going to get and keep a great assistant, not just anyone. And the fourth level is I'm going to get and keep a great assistant that's wildly profitable for me. And that to me is what we should be striving for. Because there's two cardinal sins that almost every entrepreneur is committed, right? When it comes to hiring an assistant, right? And if the question is just how do I get an assistant, you can go on Facebook or LinkedIn and just say, hey, who knows someone? And you can hire the very first person who comes through. You can do that. Yep. You can do that. And guess what? You've accomplished, you've solved the riddle of how do I get an assistant? You've got one. You have not done anything though to solve the riddle of how do I keep that assistant or how do I make sure that I hire a great assistant or how do I make them profitable? Those are other riddles. They're all related, but they are different riddles. So, and it's like one of our clients, uh, his name is Jimmy and he's giving me permission to share the story. You know, when he saw, you know, some of the extra work that goes into actually, like we recommend people look at between 50 and hundred candidates, believe it or not. Yeah, I know it's a jaw dropper, but yeah. And when we're doing it on behalf of people, we're looking at the equivalent of 50 to 100 candidates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to be totally candid, if you're going to do a great job, you're probably looking at 50 to 100 hours of work 
to properly vet, find, onboard a great assistant. So not through us, obviously, if we're doing, we're doing it for you. But if you're doing it DIY, that's what it takes. And so one of our clients had said, this is too much work. I'm just going to go on Facebook. Let's just quick and dirty this thing. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Go for that it. That sounds like something I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so he did, you know, he got an assistant within days, hired them, and within six weeks they were gone. Mm-hmm. And I asked him, you know, did you do a Colby? And he said no. And so, you know, on our team, we, you know, we've got multiple people that are Colby certified as part of our process. Yeah. So about six months later, he came back to us and said, Tim, I'm ready to do it the proper way this time. I said, oh, that's great. That's awesome. So it took him about six months, but he not only got his great assistant within 30 days, that assistant freed up so much of his time, energy, and headspace that he could finally launch a product that had been on his mind for six years. And that was the first six months of his great assistant experience. And in the six months after that, that product that he launched made a quarter million dollars in additional new revenue. So you might say, what's the cost of an assistant? I think a valuable counterpoint is what's the opportunity cost of not having an assistant. And you might look at Jimmy's situation and say, well, it looks like it was $250,000. But if you realize that was $250,000 in six months and he'd had that idea for six years, that's $250,000 in six months. That's half a million in a year. Half a million multiplied by six years is $3 million. So that was a $3 million opportunity cost to not have his assistant. So I just think that Having that appreciation and that mindset, a bit of a longer view, I think that that can help us to get through some of that early grind Uh of feeling like, ooh, this sounds like a lot of work. I'd rather just stick with what I got. So having an onboarding process, super, super valuable. I always talk about the four A's and a P. I actually did a video for Forbes talking about the four A's and a P, which we can get into that. You have to tell me, what are they? What are the four A's and a P? I have to. <laughs> That's just too, uh, too much of a teaser. Come it's on. It's just too much. Well, I'm going to keep giving you a few more to tease so you can I choose know. what you want from the buffet. Yeah. The second is surgeon in the room. And actually, I think that's maybe one of the most important of everything. If we only touch on that from this little buffet, I think that could be powerful. Actually, also 360 delegation, the three pieces to delegating. There's also like, what kind of meeting rhythm should I be on with my assistant? And there's also, what are the first three tasks that I should hand off to an assistant? So, I mean, we can go down any one of those roads when it comes to practical on the ground tactics. What would you like to do, Shannon? (laughs) I want to do all of them because I'm greedy. Actually, there's one question I want to make sure we answer, which we haven't yet. I don't know if there's a short Hmm. version of this story, but you had figured out how to get your own great assistant, which is so fun because I just call it the strategic assistant, but I know we're talking about exactly the same thing because I actually want someone who's going to manage me, not the other way around. But at some point you pivoted to actually this being your business and doing it for other people rather than just having your own. So just briefly cover how that happened. I'm curious. Like why did I go from having a digital marketing company to having an executive assistant company? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Is there a short version of that? No, there is. My assistant was taking so much off my plate and my friends were jealous. That's really it. They were like, what do you mean your assistant is like pulling reports and helping prepare them for all your marketing clients? And what do you mean your assistant is the one who's doing all the onboarding of all your clients? And what do you mean it's your assistant who's doing all this like tech work, setting up landing pages for your clients? And what do you mean your assistant prepares you with meeting notes so you're ready for every meeting? What do you mean? I just went on and on and I'm like, oh, well, isn't that what you would have your assistant do? (laughs) Like, I guess it was just an instinct I had or something. And more people were asking me about getting an assistant than getting help with their marketing. So I just just live live by, I was standing in the shower one day. I don't mean to make this weird. uh, So my best ideas come in the shower. I call them shower thoughts. This just hit me one day. I said, let demand drive decision making. So that's a guideline we live by inside my company is let demand drive decision making. What that means is, yes, that means, like, what do we offer clients? Yes, for sure. Like, we're not going to fight the current, if you will. And I think that's the instinctive version of let demand drive decision making is what is the market asking for. I think, though, this goes deeper. And I think it goes beyond the front stage of business into the back stage of business. And in the back stage of business, we ask ourselves questions like, what should I delegate? What processes should I write? right? Like these are kind of some backstage style questions. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is let demand drive Mm decision-making, right? So entrepreneurs too often, I see them, they'll say, oh, I've always wanted to start a podcast. 
I'm going to buy a podcasting course. I'm not going to study it. I'm going to throw it at my new assistant and say, you go study it and figure it out and let's launch a podcast. And I just think that's like a horrible, horrible place to start. The number one highest revenue and profit producing person in the entirety of your business is you. So we need to optimize you and make you far, far, far closer to your unique ability. And we need to get you to get anything that's slowing you down or pulling you away from your unique ability. And if you match unique ability with what's high margin in your business, and we get you doing more and more and more of that, we trigger what I call the positive profit loop. So this is what happened for me. And we watch it happen in client after client after client. And so basically it goes like this. I figured out that the first three tasks I had to hand off to my assistant when I had the marketing company was uploading blog posts, uploading podcast episodes, which I was already doing both of those things. And so I was actually getting time off my plate. And the third was sending invoices to clients. Now, there's really a few main advantages when you delegate things that you're already doing. Number one is you know how to train and coach your assistant on that particular task. Number two, you can review their work and give them feedback and to know if they're doing a good job or not. And number three is it's directly freeing up your time. If you pick something you're not currently doing, you throw it at your assistant, say, go do it. You yourself, you're still stuck doing the same 80 to 100 hours that you were already doing. Mm -hmm. It's insane. It's insane. We got to get you down to 70, 60, 50 to create some slack in the line. So now you can get more and more off your plate. So I hand off these three tasks to my assistant. I was so stone broke, 200 grand upside down and making only $39,000 a year. I could only afford her in the first few weeks for just five hours a week. So that's what I did. And, you know, she was slower than me. So what took me three took her five, right? So, you know, I acknowledge, I acknowledge that someone's slow when they're starting. Here's the thing though. She gave me five hours of time back, which was really more like three hours of my time. Now, what did I do at that time? Did I binge on Breaking Bad or Tiger King? No, I did not. Okay. I took those three hours. I went to my already existing clients who already knew, liked, and trusted me. had already given me money. So they're some of the ripest people on the planet to give me even more money. And I said, I got three hours of extra time. I got this idea. I've been doing online advertising for you. I know our success would go up if I could just create a custom landing page for all those ads to come to. It's just a best practice. And if you'd be willing to hire me, because my rate at the time is $40 an hour. So I said, if you're willing to give me $40 an hour times three, I'd be more than happy to make that happen for you in the next seven days. Guaranteed, we're going to see an increase in our click-through rate. And the client said, well, yeah, I mean, Tim, you've always done a great job with us. You know what you're doing. You're a good guy. Sure, let's go for it. You know, it's, it's only 120 bucks. Let's go for it. So off I'd go. And I set it up and it was a great success. Now, what did I do with those $120? Did I go and buy some new jeans? No, I did not. I took those $120 and I turned to my executive assistant, Sarah, and I said, I'd like to buy even more of your time, right? Divide that by $15 an hour. It's just under 10 hours, like eight hours or something like that on top of what she was already doing for me. And she gave me eight hours. Now, maybe that might only be like five or six hours of my time because I'm faster. But what did I do those five to six hours? Did I take a whole day off? No, I did not. What I did is I went back to my clients. And now I was able to capitalize on five hours, not three hours at my $40 an hour. And now 120 becomes 150. And now I could go back and forth getting more money from my clients, which led to more time from my assistant, which led to more money from my clients. And as this just picked up speed, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And along the way, I realized one of the highest value activities I could possibly ever do in my business is delegate, Mm -hmm. to take the time to slow down and coach my team on the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And this is a super pro tip. Pick things that you're doing that you yourself are already doing and pick the things that repeat regularly every single week. When someone says, oh, my assistant's going to help me with my taxes, I'm like, well, that's great, but that's, you know, quite possibly a once a year activity or maybe a once a quarter activity where you're pulling statements, but it's certainly not an every week activity. Mm -hmm. Let's find things like sending invoices or creating reports or setting you up for meetings or let's, you know, email inbox. That's like a five times a day thing minimum for most people, right? Let's get those regular items off your plate because obviously it makes no sense to spend 30 minutes training someone on a five minute task right? Or a 10 minute task, let's say 10 minutes. That's a bad deal. Why would I spend 30 minutes training an assistant on a 10 minute? That's something I could do in 10 minutes. Well, if the measuring stick is just one repetition, then obviously it's a bad deal. Don't do it. 
But if that task is happening twice a day, five days a week, so that's 10 times a week multiplied by 50 work weeks a year, that task is happening 500 times. And now you're telling me that you're not willing to put in half an hour to get 10 minutes times, what did I say, 500 repetitions? Uh-huh. So I can get you 5,000 minutes back for the 30 you got to put in. Are you ready to do that deal? Right? So all of a sudden, someone's like, oh my Lord, I would get an entire week or two back of my life if I just put 30 minutes in, you know, once, maybe twice if I need to review the quality of the work. This is the best description I've ever heard of the payoff. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> this is so good. But people don't think about it. They don't play out the long term. And how you talked about what you did with your time when you got it freed up. Dan actually has a very similar story, which is really fun. But that whole kind of circular, you know, upward spiral of productivity. And I haven't documented it as clearly as you did. But when I first started with Nicole, who you met a few minutes ago, I've tripled, if not quadrupled, my productivity working with her. <sighs> And then you look at my calendar, you're like, holy mackerel, it's nuts. And I'm only doing stuff I should be doing. I'm not doing anything else. And I require setup and completion before and after, but it's amazing. But you're so finite and you're so specific about the details of this. I absolutely love it. You're so good too. All right. So I want to make sure I have time to jump into some of these other brilliant things that you're talking about. So you talked about four A's and a P. I still need to know what that is. I think we should do 360 delegation next. Okay. Oh, good. That was next on my list. Okay. Yeah. 360. Here we go. Yeah. Because it is the single most bookmarked blog post. There's teams of like 50 people in offices that all have 360 delegation bookmarked in their Chrome browser. And it's, I've gotten messages of people like crying with gratitude and relief that they're like, Oh my God, I've wanted my CEO or my, you know, boss or my owner to use something like this for years and we've never found anything until now. So I created 360 delegation before I ever joined coach. And I'd say that the 360 delegation layout has like, it's got to be like, I don't know, a cousin or a distant, you know, second cousin or something to the impact filter. Good. Yeah. So the 360 delegation, when we're delegating a task to a teammate, we really want to touch on three key areas. (laughs) Actually, I taught this once at an event and someone from the U S military walked up to me and said, we use something very similar for this when we have a critical mission, like if we're going into battle. I was like, oh, oh that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> Literally battle tested, not hyperbole, you know? <laughs> so, I love it. Yeah. So the first part is vision. What is it that you want to accomplish by when? What are the milestone dates? What's the drop dead deadline? And this is such a pro tip is include a sample of success. Mm. So if you want your assistant to send an invoice, show them what a successful invoice looks like. If you want them uploading a blog post, show them a successful blog post. Like a sample of success just makes all the difference in the world. The second area, and I get very granular on this. You can see a complete list on our website is resources. So I have clients that have now set up the whole 360D format as like a canned response in their Gmail So anytime they're delegating something to an outside vendor, they literally pull up the canned response and they can just go through the 360 delegation checklist and say, oh, I included this. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need it. It's brilliant. Nice. Yeah. Another great tool is text expander. It allows you to just hit a couple hot keys on your keyboard and it populates all this information. So that's another way that people are using our 360 delegation tool. And when I talk about resources, you know, I'm talking about like what logins are required. And like, we literally have a checklist that you can go through each one of these. What logins are required? Is there physical access required into a building? Are there outside people such as clients, subcontractors, you know, or vendors or coaches, consultants that we need to work with? You know, is there money required? Are there decisions that are required along the way? Are there other languages required if we're working with other countries, cultures, or languages? There's a whole inventory. Are there templates that are required? Are there SOPs that are required? Right. And so I literally have a checklist and we go through that. And this is maybe what makes it very different than the impact filter. One of the things that makes it very different is, you know, at a granular level. And so us as a leader, like, you know, so I got my scrum certification a few years ago, which is a project management and a product development method. And man, in scrum, they just do such a great job of discussing the cost of changeover. So the cost of changeover and a really great visual is like, what if I went to a factory and said, this factory line is going to make Ford Focus cars. I don't even know if those exist anymore, but this is going to be a Ford Focus production line. And then from there, if we say, okay, 
stop the presses here, stop the factory, stop the line. We're going to now make a Ford Bronco with this same line. So we have to now stop production, change all the tools, maybe even change some of the staff, retrain, change the SOPs, the safety documentation, all of it. So whatever amount of time that takes, days, weeks, months, is the cost of changeover to change over to something else. Now, knowledge workers have the same effect on a smaller scale, and it's hard to identify it because it's invisible, mm. right? So if you're to say, hey, Tim, can you please describe how you host a dinner party? I can start with that. But then if the phone rings and someone says, hey, Tim, I'm wondering if you'd like to come speak at our event, I would have to stop offboard myself off the dinner party conversation, onboard myself into speaker mode. And once that's done, I'd have to pay the changeover cost a second time to come back to you to talk about dinner parties. Every time we have to switch, Todd Herman calls it context switching. Every time I have to context switch, I am not productive. Bill Gates has a great quote that is systems, strengths, and weaknesses are magnified with scale. So if things are going well with your assistant, you've got more scale than if you're just a solo, right? And so the good is going to be really good. The frustrating parts are going to be really frustrating. And if you think that's bad with an assistant, imagine when you've got 10, 20, 50, 100 people, right? Yeah. yeah. So every time your assistant or whoever you're delegating to has to stop because they don't have all the resources that they need, you're now incurring four costs of changeover. They have to stop what they're doing, change gears to ask you for help. You have to stop what you're doing, give them the help send it over to them. You have to switch your context back into what you were working on and they now have to switch back into the context that they've received. And that is monstrously, monstrously inefficient. Right. So instead of paying the 4X cost of having to deal with all that context switching, which is invisible to ourselves, not just for ourselves, but it's also invisible. We don't actually physically see our assistant having to do that change over, but they are too. Instead of paying that very, very, very expensive price. We can pay a far smaller price and just be thoughtful when we make the delegation in the first place. Mm. And by going through our list of resources, is my assistant going to require a login? Is my assistant going to have to work with anyone else? Is my assistant going to require access to a building? Something like that. As if I just kind of like play it through in my head, now all of a sudden, and look, I'm the one who invented 360 delegation and I still miss things. And I catch myself when I look at my own list. I'm just like, oh, this is a smart list. Like some smart guy must put this together, right? So, so in the third area is definition of done. And that's a word I took directly from Scrum. I asked them if I could use that term. They said, yes, it's you know, open source. You're welcome to take it. Definition of done is how do I know the job is done properly and or what criteria do we have to sign off to say it's complete? Yes, it's great to say, hey, the podcast is live. That would be in my vision. But the DOD, the definition of done, would say, we've stored the completed audio file in this Dropbox folder. Nice. We've gotten a sign-off on the PR you know, release from the person we interviewed. We have seen the episode published confirmed page in my online software. I've seen that page. So I can say that it's going to go live on the date and time that we set, right? Or it's 300 by 600 JPEG or it's a WAV file or whatever. So it's that criteria for success that if I can check off all those boxes, I know this job is done to standard. I can't tell you how many times I've said, no, Tim, stick to the process. I've caught myself. It's dramatically improved my delegation and the person who received it didn't have to come back at all. No more boomerang tasks. I feel like that should be a hashtag. No more boomerang tasks. Right. We're sending it to someone and it boomerangs back. No. 360 delegation works actually at a very micro level on something like, hey, send a blog post you know, to someone or upload a podcast. But you can also, if you think about, we can apply 360 delegation when we're talking about like a quarterly plan with our marketing director, uh-huh. right? We can use 360 delegation at that level too. It's not just you know small discrete tasks. It can also be, wide entire projects where we're really thinking things through. And a perfect example is the last time we hosted our 80-20 summit in San Diego, I worked for probably two weeks on a 360 delegation with my assistant. Two weeks, we went back and forth, creating a budget, creating a budget. And because we were creating this 360 delegation, it forced me to ask questions like, oh, do I care about scones in the back or should they be cookies or like... Right? So it's a forcing function that requires me to think ahead and, and, you know, do I want AV? Do I want live streaming? Do I not want live streaming? Do I want pens and lanyards and booklets? Do I not? Like, is our team, when they fly in, are we staying in a hotel or are we staying in an Airbnb so we can all be together? Like, 
right? So there was just like this blizzard of questions. It took us about two weeks and, you know, and, and I'd send her off like, Hey, go research the cost of lanyards, go research this, that, and the other thing. But after two weeks of intermittent meetings about it, we came up with a clear 360 delegation of what success looks like on this event. She went out, executed the whole thing. I might've spent two hours in the intervening, like three months on three, four or five months, whatever it was on it. The event went off. It happened. It came within 1.6% of budget, which is unheard of in the event world. Oh my God. I know. And my only job, Shannon, was to be the surgeon in the room. The surgeon in the room does three things, strategy, high level skill, high level access. That's it. Not maintenance, coordination, setup, onboarding, researching, common errands, tech support, customer support, like none of those other categories of tasks. Three things and three things only. Strategy. So I set the strategy in the beginning. That's a 360 delegation I did with Sarah. Then from their high level skill, my job was to come up with the content of what I'm teaching at this high end two day event. It's also high level skill to get up on stage and speak. And then high level access was I'm the only one with my face you know, to show up on some webinars to promote this thing. And high level access was also me interacting with the other lead speaker because I co-presented with Perry Marshall and us having our high level, you know, kind of speaker to speaker, owner to owner conversations about what the event would look and feel like. And then high level access was also me shaking hands at the welcome reception and taking pictures with everybody, all the attendees as they came through the door. That's all I did. I was literally just the lead singer of the band, showed up, for sound check, showed up for the main thing, signed some autographs, and that was that. I was not running cables or refilling, you know, M M&M and M bowls in the green room. Well, there's so much. Oh my gosh, you Pat, thank you for doing both of those things <laughs> together. That's awesome. What impresses me, your 360 delegation is so clear, and you know, Gallup even talks about the fact that the number one thing that frustrates team members the most, their source of dissatisfaction, is not knowing what's expected of them. Love and that. Yeah, yeah, and you've done this not just for a job, but actually for a very specific result. By the way, that's not a small event that she pulled off, all of you pulled off, but that's a big deal. There's a ton of details. And so often, I mean, as someone who is trying to eliminate the requirement for assistance to be mind reading, <laughs> <laughs> mind readers, or I used to call my program Mind Reading 101, oh my. But, which I can do from a context standpoint of how entrepreneurs think, but I can't do it with the specifics of a particular event, which is really where the 360 delegation comes in. And I think some people just lose patience with the details, but yep. you work it out together. Sometimes you can't make a decision as the owner because you don't have enough information, but then you send someone out for research. So I think being willing to go to that level of pre-planning, first of all, prevents a ton of teamwork headaches. So yay <laughs> for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. And that whole 4X cost of, you know, when people have to switch tasks and I read a brilliant book by Dave Crenshaw called The Myth of Multitasking. And he talks about switch tasking. Mm -hmm. And he's got mm -hmm. this really fun, quick exercise mm -hmm. at the beginning where he has you do two activities. They're different. One's numbers, one's letters. And then you have to switch between them. And I'm fast. Mm -hmm. I'm fast yeah. talker, fast lots of things, but it still took me twice as long to switch wow. tasks. And I was like, hot damn, it doesn't matter if I'm fast. I'm still twice as slow. <laughs> it was really interesting. I'm sure it's on a video some, on YouTube somewhere. But yeah, the whole thing of myth of multitasking, and it's interesting because you're a massive fan and user of Colby as am I. And you know, I think as a short follow through, two out of 10, that it's pretty easy for me to switch. And I, it's true, mostly because there was no plan in the first place. There's no recalibration that has to happen. So if it costs me time and mental energy to switch tasks, that's saying something. And then you'd work with someone who's got tons more mental energy for being systematic and following through and finishing. You're having to like pull them back from where they were to this, going back to your idea of switch tasking, you know, pull them back to this. I mean, the time lost is huge. And I think we, you know, blithely interrupt people and, hey, what about this? And we throw in random stuff and they're like, what? What do you want? Our team members want to make us happy, mm -hmm. but we don't make them happy. So I'm not surprised that people have come up to you and gone, this is what I've been wanting for years. That's just a brilliant point. And then again, the whole surgeon in the room, in our terminology, doing your unique ability with your best audience for the highest impact where you can be a hero and make the big, be the most useful. I mean, this is the how, this is the really concrete, tangible 
ways to actually do that granular you were saying. And I just appreciate that because it's not something I think I would ever have the patience to figure out. Even though I'm yeah. passionate about teamwork and talk about it all the time, you've done the work to put that system and process in place. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, for a little while there, I, I worried that this was not appealing to, because I'm a 7635, so I'm high on yep. fact finding and follow through. So I was like, that's not most entrepreneurs. I'm a weirdo in a room of weirdos, you know? <laughs> 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 yes, the host uh, of Misfit Toys, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. Of course, I'm being playful about us entrepreneurs. So I actually went around to a few of my clients, and it was a little vulnerable for me to just be like, is this me just being the strategic planner, which is formerly what my Colby score was called by the Colby Your natural Corp. advantage, yes. My natural advantage, yeah. I was like, is this me just kind of like geeking out on my own Colby score, and this is never really going to get me traction in the big wide world? Here's the two bits of feedback I got. Number one, Tim, uh, and this is actually an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yes. So let that one reverberate, right? And so if you're going to go with others, now we've got a new set of questions, like what makes a great team? And if we've just got a whole team of people who are zero, zero, ten, zero, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Fortunately, it's, one is the minimum, but yes, I understand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. At negative 100, negative 110. Yeah. Uh -huh. I really think, you know, almost on a spiritual level that there's something about having a team that requires us to surrender uh, yeah. to the needs of the team above and beyond what our individual say instincts are. Sometimes we can't do it all the time on a forever basis. That's not sustainable, obviously. But sometimes, you know, when the baby's crying, this great Keith Cunningham analogy says, look, if the baby's crying in the middle of the night, you don't say, well, that's not my unique ability. <laughs> Hell no, you do it. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. So I think, you know, sometimes 360 delegation feels that way. And so as I was asking my very high quick start, very low follow through clients, I got such a profound answer actually from the same guy, Jimmy. He said, you know what, Tim, the reason I do 360 delegation is not because it instinctively comes to me or doesn't come to me. It's because it frees me up from having to deal with all of the back and forth. And I get to do more quick starting if I'm willing to pay the upfront price uh -huh. to be clear about what I'm expecting. An entrepreneur in Australia, his name is Mike Rhodes. He showed me a version of 80-20 that I'd never seen before. And he drew it on a napkin. If you can imagine an hourglass. So wide at the top, narrow at the middle, wide at the bottom. Uh -huh. And he said, Tim, the first... 10% of any project is kind of getting clear on where we're going, what we're doing. The middle 80% is actually executing. And the last 20% is kind of checking in on how it went. And that's the 80-20 of a project, of a campaign, even of a business. It's always the hardest at the start, right? So I put some different labels on it. I said, the first 10% is lead, the middle is do, and the last 10% is review. Lead, do, review. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are oftentimes you know, and very rightfully so, my former self included, even my current self sometimes, feel exhausted by doing the work, doing the business. Well, the secret to getting out of doing that middle 80% of doing the work is redefining what your job is. And if your job is leading the work instead of doing the work, then we need a new skill set. We need a new set of tools. We need a new strategy. And guess what? Your new tool kit, now that you're more and more a leader and less and less a doer, is 360 delegation. So just as at one point you didn't know negotiating or selling, or if you're a financial planner, you didn't know how to, you know, what was legal or illegal when it came to setting up financial plans or like, I mean, you know, baby deer shaking legs, trying to figure your way through an industry. Now it's just a different playing field, right? And so there's different tools that are required. And so just as at one point we were learning negotiation, now we're learning leading. And mm -hmm. one of your top number one tools for your holster is 360 delegation. And the better you get at it and the more frequently you use it, the more that you get yourself out of the middle 80% into the first 10% doing. And I recommend you also hold on to that last 10% of reviewing because now you get to coach your team members on how they could get better. You can catch errors. You don't have to worry about delegating things that could be catastrophic because you get to check them before they ever go live. So guess what? You're expanding the possibility of what you can delegate. I think that something that is a pleasant surprise is if entrepreneurs really commit themselves to being a coach mm. to their assistant is before you know it, not only are you going to break across this break-even point with your assistant, 
But here's a secret. Your assistant is actually going to get faster and better than you at those very same tasks. And I watched that happen very quickly with my very first great assistant, Sarah. She's since moved on, but I, I have another great assistant. She's been with us for about a year, Denise. Exact same thing. Now I ask her questions about things I used to do. And, <laughs> and, and then she's like, well, I could explain it all to Tim or I could just do it. I'm like, let's do the latter. You just do it. And so I'm like, okay, that's great. Good job, Tim. Good job. <laughs> oh, I love all of this, Tim, because you really talk about how to have a self-managed company. You know, a self-managed company is one that, frankly, you have less than 10 emails a week. That's incredible. I'm so jealous just saying, but you're willing to put the work in, you know, and you've given some phenomenal coaching today about, you know, can't even rhyme them off well enough to do things that you're already doing, right? That was a key thing that are really going to free you up time. Well, that you know how to do, well, there's a whole bunch of things already doing that are, you know, things that are repeatable because that's going to make it worthwhile over the long haul. You're going to feel confident delegating things that you know how to do because you can give feedback and then it directly frees up your time. I mean, you've just given some really practical ideas about where to start, how to think about having a great assistant, and not only for the next 10 minutes or six weeks, but actually for three years or longer. I'm excited. There's so much. And we didn't even get to because our time is wrapping up, but we didn't even get to some of the other cool stuff. You and I can always talk for like ever. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> it's one of the dangers. So before we wrap up, is there, well, before we actually hang up, is there anything that you just know that people need to know? And also I really want them to know how to get in touch with you, how to get a hold of, you know, your 360 delegation. If they want to learn more about Great Assistant, what do people need to know? What's the last words of wisdom you want to share? I do share a bunch of great content online. So if people want to follow me there, we can certainly continue the conversation that way. But so two things, one is kind of tactical and one's big picture. I would say tactically speaking, I hope, I hope everyone is starting to see that when you learn to get a great assistant, you're actually learning how to hire, manage, lead, delegate, onboard. And that's a very, very transposable skill to other areas that you want to replace yourself. Mm-hmm. So as if getting your time back wasn't a big enough prize and doubling, tripling, quadrupling the revenue you can pull in because of it wasn't enough of a prize, it's actually the perfect training ground to kick off the whole process of creating your truly self-managing company. I've replaced myself in the administration of Great Assistant. I've replaced myself in the production of Great Assistant, which is no small task, but definitely achievable. Of the 300 assistants we've placed, I think I have only matched 15 to 20 of them, and the other 280 have been done by my team. So then I replaced myself in sales, and I'm now still very involved in marketing, although I'm in the process of working with other teammates and agencies and whatnot to replace myself there as well. And guess what? When it comes to the marketing team I work with, I send them 360 delegations and they send me 360 delegations. We have an onboarding process for them. And, you know, like it's almost hilarious how much the skills you learn with your great assistant process are exactly portable to other areas. So that's kind of a tactical level. You know, we didn't really get into like, how can a virtual assistant help you with your in-person tasks? Like I've hosted 44 dinner parties in the last two and a half years and my assistant's done it entirely remotely. So I think that that's an eye opener for a lot of folks. I think at the highest or maybe deepest level, for me, at the end of the day, it comes down to really fulfilling my potential while I'm, you know, here on this earth. A decade ago, when I was on the cusp of getting my first grade assistant, I think it was just an idea. Like it was just a glint in my eye that, wow, maybe I could have someone who takes over the entirety of my email inbox or someone who can really free me up. And now that I'm on, in a sense, the other side, of having lived this way and having had this experience, I got to tell you, it's humbling because when I open up my email inbox or my team communication tool or whatever it happens to be, or my calendar, let's say, and I see, oh, our company just made $8,000 today or something like that. And I'm like, oh, that's great news. I didn't even know that that lead had come in. And I didn't know that that discovery call was booked and I didn't know that sales meeting happened and I didn't know that terms of service was signed and that that credit card number was acquired and that money changed hands and holy, like this is unbelievable. 
I'd say that's kind of like the cool Willy Wonka experience. But I'll tell you the part that probably gets me the deepest is when I get on a call with our client, because I do my best to talk to every one of our clients 60 days after they sign up with Great Assistant to hear how it's gone. And when I see just like the twinkle in people's eyes, you know, and they're like, Tim, if you had seen me 60 days ago, I had ashen skin, sullen face. I was exhausted, overwhelmed. I tried getting assistance before. It never worked out. I was skeptical about you guys. If it weren't for the resounding, you know, recommendation from, you know, my mentor or my coach or my whoever, I probably wouldn't have even tried you guys. And they're like, but it worked. Oh my God. Like it actually worked. And to see the impact that we have on helping entrepreneurs to fulfill their mission because every one of our clients is serving dozens, hundreds, thousands of customers or clients. And so to think about how in our own little way, at least it feels little, feels little and humble, we're able to expand this impact on the world. And it almost makes me emotional thinking about how a guy laying in a bed who couldn't walk had like a hunch that there was something here. To now every week get to meet the entrepreneurs who are out there changing the world and we get to be part of the success story in this little way. I'm like, wow, this is way bigger than I ever realized, which is extremely cool. So I just encourage everyone, your life matters, every day matters, and life is a team sport, business is a team sport. Go out there and make your biggest difference. Mm, I love that. And both you and I have the same passion for entrepreneurs and freeing them up. And you know what it's like to see them captive and trapped yeah. and stuck and not doing, not being the surgeon in the room, not making their biggest and best contribution. And then you get to see these brilliant, 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 talented assistants who actually thanks to your help, help them work more closely and better together and all the leverage that can happen and have them be long-term and profitable. I deeply appreciate the work that you do. And the thing we haven't even talked about, I haven't really got to brag on you yet about how well you do it. So this is my little, my little ad for you is that you have an incredible retention rate. So you had 85 to 90% stick rate at 90 days. You do your check-in, mm-hmm. which is even higher at 60 days. And 80% 12 months or longer, and net promoter score of 90 to 100, which is, yeah. again, unheard of. And a great testimonial, which I don't know if we have time to read, but from Gina Pellegrini, who's one of our brilliant coaches, and whose business is also, you know, placing great people, particularly around sales conversations. So I feel like you're really the expert. And again, I'm just so thrilled that we've had this conversation. Of course, now I want to have another one because, you know, I don't find too many other people who really get the incredible power. I almost feel like having an assistant is a nuance or it's something that's taken for granted or people don't really get the actual power of it but you do. <laughs> mm. So mm. to me, this is super fun. The strategic assistant program was the first thing that I ever created 25 years ago. So yep, long time, crazy, but I don't know how to do what you do, which is to find and place really great people. So Timothy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So how can people track you down? No, Timothy, <laughs> not Tim Ferriss. I don't want anyone to get mixed up, but Timothy Francis. So where can they track you down? How can they get all the great information and more about great assistant? Yeah, I think the very first place for people to go is greatassistant.com forward slash strategic coach. And yeah, and so on that page, we've put the resources I've talked about today, like 360 delegation. We actually also have a time study spreadsheet there. If someone wants to download that, track their own time and get a sense of like what's really going on with my day. That's a pretty powerful tool. So I'd head over to greatassistant.com forward slash strategic coach. Of course, that's the double C of strategic with C and coach Thank with the you. C. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Or don't put an X like I do sometimes. Don't ask. My typing yeah. skills leave something to be desired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then on that page, there's also a button that you can book a discovery call with our client advisor. His name is Eric. He'll be asking you questions to discover fit timing and profitability. Like we talked about you and I mm-hmm. just at the start of this conversation. I think people are sometimes shocked how much business we turn away not because we don't want to help people, but you know, because we realize it just might be a little bit too early. Or sometimes people will say, hey, I'm really excited about getting an assistant. And then we find out that like they're giving birth to a child in like six weeks from now. And so like their top priority should probably be their child at that point, not their new assistant. You know what I mean? So what I can promise is that 
Eric will help direct you in whatever way looks like it makes the most sense. And if it's not through us, then he can give you some other resources. Or if he thinks it's just a little bit early, he can set up a timeline to maybe circle back in three months or something like that. So that's available. We don't charge for that. I think we could charge for that. We don't at this time. So go ahead and jump on that. And it's at greatassistant.com forward slash strategic coach. Awesome. 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 Tim, thank you so much. Thanks for all the work you've done, all the pain you went through to get to this realization. But not unlike a lot of entrepreneurial stories and successes come out of extreme agony, lots of different forms of that, and really desire to not have that ever happen again, and that there's just some incredible learning, and I'm grateful that I get to share in that, and then to share your wisdom and knowledge and what you've gleaned with my audience, who I care deeply about. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we might need another conversation because I still didn't get to find out what 4 A's and P are. <laughs> so but we'll have to do that on another day which I think will be fun so thank you everyone very much for listening again Tim thank you any questions or comments please let us know at questions at strategic coach and as always from both of us here's to your team success mm-hmm.